Okay, so we are recording. Great, thank you, Stephanie. And uh, welcome everybody on a nice Friday afternoon, or I guess it's not quite afternoon yet, uh, to the uh, Town of Amherst uh, Solar Bylaw Working Group for Friday, May 12th, 2023. Uh, good to have a quorum. Uh, thank you for the um, public participants that we have with us. Um, and um, let me just, the first order of business is typically to uh, assign the note taker. I believe it was Martha and, last time. Yeah, but I, I thought there was an out of order. Yeah, so Dan, yeah, Dan, are you able? Oh, great. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then um, Jack, Jack will be next time, so I might email him to alert him. Okay. Let me just make note of that. Good. All right, great. So uh, thank you, Stephanie, for uh, putting the package together and the agenda. Um, we do have, we're a little bit backed up on minutes to approve. <laughs> um, and welcome, welcome, Martha, as well. Um, and so that will be our first order of business um, is to see if we can um, uh, review and approve the minutes that we have still outstanding. And I guess we'll work from chronological order. So the first one is from March 17th. Um, and have people had time to... Um, review the minutes and uh, and uh, if so is there um, any suggestions edits or a motion to approve the minutes of March 17th I so move <laughs> okay uh sorry for the record, who was that? Janet. <laughs> Janet. 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 Okay, great. I was looking around. Okay, great. Um, uh, second on that. I'm happy to second that motion. Okay. So I need a voice vote. So please make sure you're unmuted so I can we can hear you. Uh, and in no particular order, uh, Bregger? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. The minutes are approved. Great. Thank you. All right. And then second, we have the minutes of 414, April 14th. These went through a, uh, a, dis a, a, a discussion last meeting uh, with some suggested revisions, which have now been made. Um, so any comments on that or a motion to accept the minutes of April 14th as amended now. <laughs> I'll, I'll make that motion. Great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I can second that. Okay. And Laura with the second. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, in no particular order, Bregger? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Great. Okay, which brings us uh, essentially up to date now to uh, review and um, accept, if we can, the minutes from last meeting, April 28th. Um, do we have any comments um, or um, a motion to accept those minutes and and uh, I was just checking yeah Martha thank you for for preparing these minutes okay. um Janet I have a comment I, I thought these were really excellent minutes and I like that you identified like the speaker but I what I really liked was when you just kind of summarized the discussion without identifying speakers you know like one point was like there was no consensus but here were the observations and I found that super useful like because it 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 just somehow just I like the idea of not identifying people as much. Just, um, I just thought that worked out really well. Yeah, well, and thank I you. Move it, was, it was a struggle. I, I, you know, really had to listen to the recording a couple of times there, but it seemed 
like that would be most helpful when we're trying to figure out what to do next about that section of the of the draft. Yeah, and I, I thought it would take extra time to do it that way. So I, I think I'm going to try that in my sad efforts at the minutes. But anyway, so I move to to accept those. <laughs> <laughs> A, uh, annotated, um, animated uh, motion. Okay, thank you, Mark uh, Janet. <coughs> Sorry. Do we have a second for um, accepting these minutes? I'm probably not allowed to accept my own minutes, so <laughs> I'll, I'll second them, Dwayne. Okay, thank you, Laura. Yeah. Okay, great. And again, in no particular order, uh, McGowan. Aye. Gregor. Aye. Corcoran. Abstain. Hanner. Yes. Pagliarulo. Yes. Okay. Minutes are approved. All right. Thank you for that. Um, next item um, is for staff updates. Um, Janet, if you could put your hand down so oh, I know that it sorry. goes up again, because I'm sure sorry. it will. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so, so staff updates. Uh, uh, obviously, we'll be hearing from Chris later on the on the uh, on the drafting that she and her group has done. But um, first, um, uh, Stephanie, any updates on your side of the staff? Sure. So um, I did meet with uh, Adrian last week. And she is working on uh, finalizing the report. We should probably have it within the next week or so. Um, as far as the GIS map layering, um, that's taking longer because our GIS expert is working on a town-wide munis effort. And it's um, mainly him by himself working on this particular piece. And it's very involved. So um, he will get to it as soon as he can. He's He's certainly making an effort. It's just that he's got a pretty full plate right now. So um, he can only get to it when he can get to it. So, uh, but it will be sooner. I mean, he is, he knows it's a priority. So he will be trying to get to that. Uh, I think again, also within a week or so. So as soon as that map is ready, I will schedule on our agenda a time to review it, but I can't do it until that happens. So, but I will as soon as, and you will get the um, report in your packets as soon as it becomes available to me. Great. Um, great, Martha, on that. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, I listened to the ECAC meeting this week, and I would like to ask you about a comment you made because it was rather puzzling to me. Uh, so I quote your product, your, your statement here, that the Solar Bylaw Working Group product is just a stab with no guarantee that anything they say will be in the final document. Right. What so by that? Right. that means that what you're producing is a draft document. It's not the final version of the bylaw. The bylaw has to actually go to the town council. So it's very likely that the CRC are going to take it and review it. And so you're giving them the best work that you are researching. And I think they're going to certainly take that um, and accept it with that in mind. But there may be additional research or comments or changes and edits that they uh, feel they want to make or bring up because ultimately they're the regulatory body. So you're just drafting it. You're not creating the actual final language. And also the planning board, I believe, is going to review it as well. Yes, understand that that the planning department then takes it and goes through their procedures and then it goes to the town council. But your statement is really rather disparaging. And I'm really troubled when you say that our product that we're spending hours and hours on is just a stab with no guarantee that anything they say will be in the final document. I find it troubling that you are making that kind of statement as a public employee here, because it would seem that we're doing more than taking a stab. We're doing our best to try to come up with a decent document that reflects the, the very best interests of our town that we can and it's really troubling to hear statements like that. Um, well, Martha, I sincerely apologize because that is certainly not my 
uh, belief in the work that this group is doing. I think you've all been incredibly committed and it may be just in the moment when I was just sort of speaking off the cuff, it just sort of came out that way, but I certainly don't feel that way at all. And I certainly apologize if it um, offended you in any way, because I don't believe that. I think you're all working really hard. And I think, as I said, I think you're going to give them the best document that you can. I just, I also know that there's a bigger process and, you know, and I know that at times things do get changed. Um, you know, I've just been through some of that with another um, effort that was, um, that was being put forward that got changed and edited and a whole bunch of work that some people had done got removed. I, you know, so I think maybe I was coming from that experience. So I apologize. It's not a reflection on your work. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I, I would just say, yeah, maybe a, a little uh, rough on the on the choice of words there, um, but um, nonetheless, I think we're all aware that um, we are drafting something for the um, uh, uh, ruling bodies of the of the town council and the planning committee to consider uh, in their deliberations uh, and, and the f finalization of the bylaw. Um, obviously, we're going to have. Um, uh, very much influence on that because we're giving them a draft uh, that reflects our best work, um, and um, and that's that's what we've been called to do. Uh, but um, I, I think Stephanie's point was also that um, there may be some very tough things that we um, have a hard time grasping and coming coming up with in terms of final decisions, final conclusions. Uh, to some extent, we don't have to. We, we we can feel some relief that there are other bodies that will be looking at this uh, and doing some due deliberation and due considerations of those issues from from their perspectives as well. Uh, but I think we're all aware that that um, what we're doing is not legislating anything or, or putting anything in We're we're providing um, our best recommendations on behalf of the of the citizen constituents of, of the town. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, Janet, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, so I always think it's good to go back to our charge and to see what the town council asked us to do. And um, it says to develop a solar bylaw that will be transmitted to the town council and the planning board for review. It also says um, provide a solar bylaw to the town council on or before May 31st, 2023, which we know we're not going to meet. So it sounds like that looks really clear to me is that we do a, a great draft. Hopefully we send it to the town council. We send it to the planning board, who, by the way, would like to see earlier drafts. Um, and then at that point, I think the town council goes into the process where they're going to send it to the CRC and they'll send it to the planning board. And the planning board has a statutory duty under Massachusetts law to make a recommendation. And the CRC also, you know, under whatever their process is, would make a recommendation or adjustments and things like that. So we are sending a draft directly to the town council. And I, so I think that's important to know um, and just sort of stick to what we were asked to do. So a little clarification. Thank you. Okay. Um, Stephanie, anything else in terms of updates? Great, thank you. Um, uh, Chris, how about you from the um, planning department? Any updates um, apart from the um, drafting? Yeah, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals had its first session of a public hearing on the uh, battery storage facility on um, Sunderland Road, 515 Sunderland Road, and that was um, a couple of weeks ago. I think it was April 27th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they are going to have another um, session on that on May 25th. And um, the first session, I would say, went well. The uh, ZBA asked a lot of good questions. They, Some of them had taken a site visit a few days before and became familiar with the site. Um, and Chris Bascom from the fire department was there, and he felt that um, that the plan was a good plan and that it had been explained well to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think I've told you about this before. Um, maybe I told you about it on the 28th. <laughs> All the meetings kind of tend to roam together in my head. But anyway, it was a successful meeting in my opinion. And um, now we're looking at May 25th as the next meeting with, with that group. So um, the 
the applicant has a lot of questions that they need to answer, but they are providing answers. And I won't actually be at that Zoning Board of Appeals meeting on the 25th, but um, you might want to watch it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, Janet. Um, I have a question. I It's probably for the minutes that we just approved, but Chris, this battery is not get, is this battery storage facility getting energy from the arrays next the solar arrays next to it or is it just storing energy off the grid when it's cheaper holding it and then giving it back when it's more expensive or more needed is it i mean is it connected to those arrays may i answer that yeah please um it's not directly connected to those arrays um it is storing energy from the grid and giving it back when it's most needed. Um, it is the intention to um, allow, that will allow the um, electricity, the utility to charge less for electricity because if it's all, um, you know, being generated and needed at the same time that, you know, um, costs individual rate payers more. Um, so it's really an, en an endeavor to capitalize on the, um, energy that's being generated during the day, being able to store it so that it can be used, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon or whenever people are most uh, needing of, of uh, power in their home cooking and doing their laundry, et cetera. Um, yeah, so it's not connected directly to the um, solar arrays that are nearby. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, Laura, you have something to add? Yeah, no, just really briefly, like, but the laws of, so Chris is right, but the laws of physics basically go that, you know, energy is going to flow to the point of um, nearest consumption. So if the batteries are absorbing power and the solar is right next to the batteries, you know, and, you know, presumably the batteries are primarily going to be charged with solar. So just, uh, I want to make that clarification. Yeah, <clears throat> but there's no contractual um, connections. No, but it's also, it's important to note because I know this group has also had discussions about, oh, why can't we buy power from New York? And um, because it, it doesn't work like that. Whenever, wherever the solar is or any energy in general, the, the power, the electrons produced on the grid are going to go to the points of consumption. So if I had a house, I was against coal, which I am, and I had a house next to a coal plant and I was all about renewable energy, whether I like it or not, the energy from the coal plant is going to provide electricity to my house. So the, the way you get, the way you maximize grid efficiency and reduce waste is to build the, um, the energy producing facility as close to the end users as possible, so. Yeah, despite what we do or the state government, um, we can't defy the laws of physics. <laughs> so, um, all right. Um, great. Thank you, Laura. Um, any, any other uh, staff updates? Super. Thank you. Um, okay. How about committee updates from any of the committees we, um, other committees we sit on? Yep. I don't have anything from, uh, ECAC particularly. All right, good. Um, okay, great. Um, this is helpful because uh, we don't have any other um, uh, guest lecturers or anything today, so we can really spend um, a, a good amount of time on uh, on what we really need to get done, which is uh, um, the bylaw. Uh, and so why don't I turn it over to Chris, um, who uh, uh, prepared and distributed, or at least uh, Stephanie distributed some drafts of uh, of the language that um, Chris has, has uh, been working on. So Stephanie, if you would take um, a minute to bring up the nexus statement, that would be um, appreciated. Um, and this nexus statement is a as um, is really just a first draft of trying to put some thoughts down on why are we writing this bylaw the way we're writing it. And in my own mind, I'm. Um, I'm believing that Amherst is not going to say you can't put um, solar on farmland and you can't put solar in forests. We're going to try to minimize harm to 
um, farmlands and forests to the extent that we're able to do that. But I'm, I'm not viewing this as um, uh, that we're going to put an, a bylaw out there that prohibits this, um, although we may put limitations on it. And in order to do that, um, we need to um, describe why we're doing it. We also need to tie this to health, safety, and welfare. And I haven't really um, tried to do that yet. But uh, this is just some language that I um, that I put together just for our consideration. And then the second half of this uh, document is language that Martha put together and she sent it to me, I think, last night. So I've put that at the end here. So I think we can go over the language that I have and the language that Martha has and um, see if people agree with what I've written. Um, so it, the the meaning of a nexus statement is just to kind of tie in what it is we're uh, regulating with why we're regulating it. And I know um, Janet is also going to give some language. In fact, she I used some of Janet's language from a recent email and document that she sent in preparing this document. So um, I think, you know, it's going to be a joint effort to put this together, but this is what I have so far. So starting off, the town of Amherst recognized the importance of natural and working lands. And I should probably make a reference to um, the state, um, the state, what are they calling it now? Uh, roadmap? Yeah. Here. Um, the town also recognizes the necessity of allowing and encouraging the installation of large scale solar installations to meet our current and future energy needs. So does anyone have anything to say about that um, statement? I'm, I, I, I'm not sure if we're going to sort of wordsmith here, but I, I would just, um, the necessity of allowing and encouraging the installation of large scale solar installations to meet our current and future energy needs. I think also to, you know, make our, uh, contribute to the, um, to contribute to the need to mitigate um, the impacts of climate change. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Janet. I think this could go later at the end or somewhere, but I, I think we should um, do sites to the town Amherst um, Climate Action and Resilience Plan and then the state um, Climate Action and Resilience Plan. I think there's two. There's the 2050 one, which is the most recent, and then there's a 25 2031 which is about three months older or something like that so the roadmap is um a couple of years past but the 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 more current plans which talk a lot about the the natural working lands i think would be good citations and mm -hmm. i think we could cite the roadmap too at the end or mm -hmm. you know somewhere we cite these plans yep um yeah, they, I, yeah. I also i also thought that somewhere we should talk about you know the environmental services provided by all this land and i don't know where it has to be but it's it's it'd be good to add that in because we have a really strong statement about that in our own town plan mm -hmm. <laughs> but i love this i mean along those lines i'm not sure if it's appropriate here later um i, I mean i some recognition of of as janet says the importance of our um natural and working lands um, and maybe also some reference to the efforts and successes that the town has had already in con conserving um, conserving um, such lands, conservation lands. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. We've already put our money where our mouth is, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Therefore, this solar bylaw endeavors to balance these two sometimes conflicting goals, the preservation of natural and working lands and the provision of solar power. Mm -hmm. Amherst, unlike towns in the eastern part of the state, does not have extensive parking lots, rooftops, and other densely developed properties that can be used to mount solar arrays. While the town can indeed prioritize placing solar arrays on rooftops, parking lots, and other developed properties. Amherst also recognizes that installations on rooftops and parking lots will not meet all of our energy needs. 
In addition, these types of installations are more expensive to construct than installations on undeveloped lands. So do you want to make comments on those three paragraphs? Yeah, let me um, let me start, even though <laughs> I didn't get my hand up at first, <laughs> but, but something came to me. Um, and so um, we say that um, uh, it recognizes installations on rooftops, parking lots will not meet all our energy needs. Um, I don't think that is um, our goal necessarily um, to have enough solar to meet all our energy needs um, because um, you know we're going to get offshore wind, large scale hydro, uh, as as will the rest of the Commonwealth yeah. from 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 yeah. elsewhere. So it's not really to meet all of our needs, but um, uh, so I, I would probably modify that to be more like um, will likely be insufficient to meet our clean energy goals or something along those lines. Okay, and then... Um, Wait a minute, let me write that down. Yeah, okay. Will likely be insufficient to meet our... Clean energy goals. Clean energy goals okay good okay great um great i don't know who was uh, first but i'll go with martha <laughs> okay well, I, sorry wouldn't mind if janet went first but i would disagree with the statement that says in addition these types of installations are more expensive to construct um that depend that has a lot of it depends is you know expensive for whom, for what reason, et cetera. And I would ask to remove that sentence. I don't think it's needed. I would push back on that a bit. I, I, I think um, I, I think it's helpful uh, to recognize that um, it, it does cost more. But uh, for whom, Duane? Um, I mean, we've you and I have had that discussion before. I think. I think ultimately for the ratepayers of Massachusetts, because we pay more incentives uh, for those for those uh, for those projects. But but that's the point: is paying incentives to do the best thing. That's why we have incentives, and that shouldn't be a reason not to use the incentives for that. I would I would really say that that's a you know, a controversial enough statement that it really doesn't belong here in our in our bylaw. I, th I think the, the main point is that if you add up all the parking lots and the rooftops, you don't get enough acreage. I think that really is the, the main point. I would agree with that. <laughs> and, and you, you know, that was in fact what you presented to the ECAC when you were doing your calculations too. Well, so, and actually, the GZA report will bear that out as well. Where we, yeah. we'll see if that that's born. Yeah. Out. So, so I think we should just, you know, stop with that. <laughs> to leave that sentence out. Yeah, that would be my, that would be my recommendation. That it doesn't, you know, it's not, it's just not relevant, and it's uh, would need, I think, a lot of qualification. Yeah. Let's. Um, any discussion on that, um, Laura? Would that. Um, uh, straight on this issue before I go to Janet. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I read this as you're not saying that solar is more expensive. You're saying that rooftop and canopy installation is more expensive. And that is absolutely a true statement um, across the board um, unequivocally. And even with the incentives in Massachusetts, you're not seeing these get done at the rate we would all like to see. I mean, that includes brownfields too, just to be clear. Although I think that's more like of a case that there are no more brownfields left in this area, but parking lots and canopies are, are quite expensive. And it's uh, pretty well understood in the state that the incentives that exist don't help offset the cost. That's why you're not seeing a lot of them. But, um, but so the cost is for whom? You mean for the developer, right? No, I mean, listen, any, you guys got to, I mean, my, my opinion is this is a, this is a, an energy generating facility, just like any other energy generating plant. And in order to get an, any kind of energy generation plant stood up, it needs to make economic sense. So the rates, like the revenue from any solar project 
that uh, community solar project in the state, which is the majority of them, that's fixed. You can't adjust that. You know, that is a known rate, whether you're an Eversource or National Grid or, or what have you. So you know the, the revenue from a project, and then you have to look at, it's kind of, it's just balancing the scale. How much does it cost to build a project? And is it worth it with the revenue that you're expecting? And as time goes on, I mean, we could write a lot more. I don't think we need to, but like as time goes on, and I've said this a million times, but the revenue from projects, especially in the Western part of the state, it's decreasing, which is the reason why, you know, there's actually not a lot of viable solar projects sites in western mass um so you know so so that coupled with um certainly the expansion expect more expensive nature of developing and owning it's owning too not just developing um rooftops and canopies like with a roof for example if i'm going to go build a commercial rooftop like we just did a, a three megawatt rooftop we, we worked on this in, in maryland um with the roof was 15 years old um prior to putting any solar on that roof, we have to replace the full roof. Or in the rental agreement, we need to basically say um, that uh, there's a clause that says, you know, it gives me ability to take off all the solar panels at a certain point in time, replace the roof, and then put the solar panels back on the roof. So it is, it's just more expensive, I don't, you know. Um, whereas a ground mount solar installation has a life right now of at least 40 years. Rooftops, commercial rooftops don't have, you know, if you be able to build a brand new roof, yes, 40 years, but um, there's a lot of a lot of criteria there. So, but again, I'm not opposed. Yeah, 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 I mean, I, I agree. I think everything you say, I would agree with, but it's still expensive for whom? Like, uh, we put solar panels on our roof. So we had to, you know, invest initially, and that was our cost. And then we get uh, you know, recoup that cost because, you know, haven't had to pay uh, Eversource yet for uh, 10 years, you know. Mm -hmm. So to me, that means that that rooftop installation, it may have been more expensive per kilowatt or something mm -hmm. when it was first installed. I mean, I would agree to that, but overall, you know, we paid the expense and we sure. feel we got our money back. So I don't feel yeah. that it's not the statement of yeah. more expensive. Uh, yeah, I mean, but, that. And so that's why I question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Martha. Like we have rooftop solar as well, but yeah. I think a few pieces here. When we're talking about, you know, first of all, you and I were able to afford rooftop solar, right? Yes. And most people can't. And when we're talking about energy generation at a larger scale, it'd be a beautiful world if everyone could have rooftop solar. Um, but uh, when we're talking about energy generation at scale, the economics have to make sense. Um, but, but also, so anyways. Yeah. Well, it has to, it, let me just add that um, it, 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 it has, to, has to make sense, obviously, for the investor. Um, but also part of that making sense is the fact that Massachusetts ratepayers are helping to incentivize the program. And, um, you know, if we pay six cents extra for parking lot canopies, that may be worthwhile. Uh, and many people would say, yes, let's do that. But it does pay. It does cost Massachusetts ratepayers more uh, because they're paying six cents extra on this incentive, um, whether that's a good a good thing to do or not. I think is is somewhat of a personal opinion, but uh, it still it still would suggest that um, it's more expensive, and it does. I, I think it does get to the ish, issue of um, public welfare to some extent uh, in terms of the, the economic cost of electricity, uh, especially as we bring solar to scale, um, and um, you know, for paying ad additional amount for more expensive solar siting, that might be worthwhile. Um, yeah, I'm not, maybe what I'm we're not saying, saying it's maybe, not, but it's going to be more expensive. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, it, maybe, maybe it's maybe what would it make you feel better, Martha, if we said um, these types of installations are more expensive um, to construct on a on a per watt basis, like to clarify, because obviously, you know, 
I mean, we, we could philosophize, you know, I mean, the actual expense of natural gas and coal is far more than what we actually pay because of the environmental yeah. economics yeah. associated with that. Yeah. But maybe if we just say on a, on a, on a um, to construct, install and manage on a per watt basis, would that, would that make you feel better? Would that sound like more, I don't know. Oh, that, that, that certainly <laughs> makes, me feel, <laughs> makes me feel better. <laughs> But I would also say that, you know, we have value judgments that are, you know, not that are in all this anyway. You know, our va we have a value judgment on the one hand that we urgently need solar in order to help with the, with the climate mitigation. But there's also a value judgment that's come out very strongly, say, in our Amherst survey of preserving forests. And you preserve forests, the more you can put solar on rooftops and parking lots, you know, so that there's value judgments on both sides. And that's why it's a, it seems like it's a statement that's kind of, you know, controversial. <laughs> so, so I, I agree with, with the, your, um, your clarification mitigating the statement, but I, I still would have the preference for leaving that statement out uh, completely. All right, Janet, did you have um, input on the, on this as well? Yeah, I think on, I was, this was going to be my third point. I think we should drop the whole sentence because it's a quagmire. And the purpose of this statement is to justify regulating or prohibiting or, you know, whatever, what the, what the bylaw mm -hmm. is doing. We don't need to wade into the financing of solar. Um, we don't want to, I don't want to talk about RECs or the state program the kilowatt hours, you know, how much comes out, that, that's going to be something that's constantly changing. I don't think it has anything to do with the nexus statement. We don't have to talk about it. And so I would just delete the sentence. Um, and, you know, you know, I could put solar on my roof as part of a lease and have no money down, right? That's achievable. It, you know, from my observation, there's a market for rooftop solar a company came into my neighborhood, Trinity, and five people put it on their roof because this guy went door to door. And there's a market for canopies because you look at UMass and what they're doing. Someone's making money on that. And there's a probably cheapest and easiest always is to take undeveloped land. And, you know, it's cheapest and easiest for the developer. There's a market for that. And that's what the market that Laura's involved in. And so I don't know why we're talking about the different markets. You know, we, we can, you know, so I just I just think it's a quagmire statement and I would just pull it. It doesn't help explain, you know, whatever we wind up doing in the um, unless we say our preference is for undeveloped land and we want to justify that. I don't know. So I would just get rid of it. But getting back to the second paragraph, I'm trying to think of things that are sort of not going to create um, controversy. But I think um, the first sentence, therefore, the solar bylaw endeavors to balance I would say balance and achieve these two, apparently these two goals, just say two goals, because these are the goals that are in the state plan. It's a goal in our action plan. Um, we need to say the word balance because the SJC is going to see that we're balancing things. It's going to balance our restrictions against the, the goal. So I would just put that in as mollifying language saying, hey, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to achieve protection of natural working lands and also solar power. So I would just put that in there. Um, it doesn't have to be conflicting, I hope. Um, I, the second paragraph I was kind of um, a little concerned about because I sort of agree with it and disagree with it. Amherst, unlike towns in the eastern part of the state, does not have extensive parking lots, rooftops, and other densely developed properties that can be used to mount solar arrays. Um, definitely, we, we don't look like Newton or Somerville. But at the same time, we do have a lot of parking lots, rooftops, and densely developed properties, but it's mostly on university or college lands. And so Amherst includes those things. I'm not sure I would say that. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, so that I'm not sure that sentence needs to be said, but I think we do have, a, you know, UMass is incredibly densely developed. Um, you know, Hampshire College is not so much so, but they have lots of rooftops and parking lots that aren't covered and things like that. So I, I'm always including the colleges and universities in the town because they're in our town. Um, and then, um, so I would just 
keep the second, the third paragraph, but just drop any kind of discussion about the economic things. I also don't think that we're looking to solar to meet all of our energy needs. So I'm not sure we need to say that. Um, right. You know, nothing will, you know, wind won't meet our energy needs, and maybe a nuclear power plant would. But it's, so it's like we're no one's asking solar to meet all of Amherst energy needs. So I just I just thought factually that didn't make sense. And so maybe we could make that sentence a little like. Um, I think we modified that one already. Yeah, but I, I think it's like, did we say all our energy needs? Like it should just be. I mean, the other should, thing is, is that we this said is, what we said was um, that it will be will likely be insufficient to meet our clean energy goal. That's what um, Dwayne uh, said. Yeah, except that we're not looking to solar to do that. And so the other thing is, is that trying to, I think, sort of flexibility, because we have this crazy shifting future in head, ahead of us. So we have this state action plan that says 40% wind, 35% solar, 15% um, is natural working lands. And then it kind of just fudges the other pieces. But now we have hydro coming in either through... Mm -hmm either through New Hampshire and Vermont are now talking about using existing lines. Um, Maine looks like they're going to have that coming in. And, you know, we also have an increasing use of geothermal by large institutions. So I kind of, I feel like this is like a very shifting, like in 20 years, we're going to look back and say, well, that was interesting, but look what actually happened. And so I just, I don't want that sentence to say solar isn't, is insufficient to meet our energy needs because we, everything is, or everything's not. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, I think it's obvious that we need solar. If you could just say that. Yeah. I think but, it's so we need solar to meet our clean energy goals to help me to, to be, to help to, me. To, to, that's good. To help me be good. Yeah. It's a funny mixed picture, you know, <laughs> sorry. Hey, let's move on. Um, so the next oh, let me paragraph. just ask uh, Dan if he has. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, um, some th thoughts. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's really important for us to acknowledge um, the economic impacts of our policy decisions. Um, you know, there's two ways to create an effective to create a ban on new solar developments. One is to outright ban it, and the other one is to ignore economics. And, and create policies that are so economically burdensome that nobody wants to come in and put in new solar installations. So by ignoring economics, we run the risk of creating an effective ban. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. And, and Laura, did, did, yeah, I, th I think you were waving your hand a bit too, so go ahead. I was, sorry, no. I, so I'm, I'm, one thing I want to say is I, I completely support what Dan's saying, and I, I do not support removing the economic statement um, from that first paragraph at all, because in addition, I mean, I, I think if we ignore the economics, like, it, it's just, it's fact. And if we said that canopies and rooftops and green fields are all created the same from an economic perspective, that's incorrect. Um, so that's, that, that's the first piece. I think, you know, our personal preferences are one thing, but that's, that's the, that's the economic environment that we live in. Um, and if there's, if the group wants supporting information stating that I'm happy to provide it. It's, it's well known across the board. And then the second piece is, um, what was the item in the second paragraph? Hang on, I'm not seeing the document right now. Oh yeah, um, the canopies, you know, um, Amherst versus Newton comparison was made. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think if we wanna, if we wanna get, you know, if we wanna discuss that, and I think it's important, the, the truth is on a, you know, on a per square footage, per capita basis, however you wanna look at it, we do not have um, the same amount of parking garages, rooftops, and so forth. So we are certainly more limited. I, I'm not quite following why there's a reluctance to include that in there. Um, and I also thought that UMass was out of, you know, was we, we couldn't consider the colleges and universities for this bylaw because they, 
as much as we want them to put in canopies and rooftops, they're kind of out of our purview. Did I get that right? I don't, I don't know if they're out of our purview. I mean, they're out okay, of- Okay, can, can someone, can, I thought that that's what, I thought that that was what was said in the beginning. In terms of zoning, our zoning yeah. laws impacting the university. Yes. Yeah. Janet, well, I thought you had a statement about the difference between UMass and, and the private colleges in that sense. Well, so, so I'm not sure how to answer the question, Laura, but we, first, the, no one looked in terms of the solar assessment. We did not, or the consultant did not look at college owned lands by UMass and Hampshire College and Amherst College. Um, so that's, but they do, they do have all those surfaces. And as Jack said, can't we work with UMass or Big Y about having canopies on their land? You know, so we, we can, can sure. That. Oh, we yeah. Can, uh, we no. can and, certainly. Work. And we can't require anybody to put solar on sure. anything unless we do a, a zoning bylaw that way. Um, Absolutely. In terms of, in terms of the, the zoning itself, we have as a zone, like as in terms of the bylaw, we you, state owned land is exempt from the local zoning, but Hampshire College and Amherst College are in the educational district, the ED district, and then they also own lands outside of that, as far as I can tell. And so our bylaw could cover those lands. It could encompass those lands. Let me let me just also point out that UMass could cover all of its parking lots with solar and still not have close to enough energy for its own needs. Um, and so, but it uh, is been, it's going to cover its needs with geothermal solar and buying solar from others offsite. So, um, uh, no, well, yeah. a lot more than solar. It'd be offshore wind. Uh, yeah be hydro, I mean, could be the electric grid eventually, with, which is just going to be clean uh, per the, the, the roadmap. Uh, but, um, but yeah, a, a small fraction would be available on campus. Um, uh, and so I'm just saying that, um, you know, I, I would be inclined, I, I think it is appropriate to point out that we're limited in our roof, roof, roof capacity and, and parking lot capacity. You know, big, big Y strikes me as as one potentially promising parking lot, but um, there's not too too much more. Okay, let's carry on. I think you know my I, I my my thought in terms of including the economic statement about these projects being limited, but but also more expensive, is appropriate uh, because uh, this nexus statement is is supposed to touch on things that relate to public health, safety, and welfare. And public welfare, part of public welfare is what we pay for energy prices um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and how much we pay, we pay as a society for um, the solar that we need and all the clean energy that we need. Um, and so um, um, I think it has some applicability to this section. All right, Chris, do you want to Sure. Okay. So we're now we're on one, two, three, four, the fifth paragraph. In order to meet our energy goals, the town acknowledges that there will be a need to place solar installations on some of our natural and working lands. Do we agree with that statement? Well, it got changed to say in order to help meet clean energy goals, right? No, no we haven't gotten to this uh, paragraph yet. This is... Oh. Um, I think you're referring to a paragraph above. So now we're on paragraph number five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Maybe some of them are a bit repetitive, but paragraph number five. In order to meet our energy goals, the town acknowledges that there will be a need to place solar installations on some of our natural and working lands. I don't see how we can not do that, um, but I think that's a statement that we need to talk about. Uh, go ahead, Janet. So just for looking for fuzzier language, I would say it is likely that it will need to or may need because I don't, we yeah. don't have specific targets in yeah. terms of solar numbers or wind or geothermal or hydro. We, our action plan doesn't call for that, doesn't, doesn't say that. And in fact, says to, it actually says not to put it on natural and working lands. So I, I don't know that we have you know, specific targets, but I could say likely or may, 
just to put some like fuzzy language in. I would agree with that. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, anybody else? Okay, um, next paragraph, number six. This bylaw endeavors to regulate such installations so that they result in the least amount of harm to the natural and working lands, and so that these lands are able to recover their former status as natural and working lands when the solar installations are eventually decommissioned and removed. Is that a statement we can all get in support of? Janet? So I, I like that statement. I wonder if we could also put in before um, to regulate them so the lands are able, can continue to provide critical environmental services and are able to recover their former status. Because some of some of the things that you're suggesting later, like with dual use, are so that the land can continue to produce food. Um, and then if we do a mitigation thing for forest land, part of the justification be like, okay, we gave X amount of acres to solar, but we protected X amount of acres so the forest can continue to provide its services. So where would you put that? I think I'd put it before um, so that these lands um, can continue to provide critical environmental services and are also able to recover. Okay. Alrighty. Oh. Um, anybody else? Um, all right, so moving down, I, I didn't write anything about forests, but I did um, write something about farmland. I picked up a lot of Janet's language that she had sent in a in an email recently or in another document. I don't remember which. And this part is not, it doesn't read as smoothly, but it's got a lot of ideas in it. So I think we should look at what it says and decide whether we agree with it or not. Um, <clears throat> so farmland. Farmland is a finite resource and should be treated accordingly. Amherst has a need to prioritize the protection of productive farmland for future food security and soil, soil carbon sequestration. Any problems with that? Okay. Um, next paragraph. It is important to reduce our reliance on unsustainably grown crops and unreliable distance supply chains through local, or I guess we could drop the organic, but through local crop production. Um, whether it's organic or not doesn't, uh, in my opinion, is not important in this arena. This is an important aspect of reducing carbon emissions. So let's read that again. It is important to reduce our reliance on unsustainably grown crops and unreliably unreliable distant supply chains through local crop production. This is an important aspect of reducing carbon emissions. Everybody agree with that? Um, I have a couple of questions, I guess. <clears throat> um, I guess what is unsustainably grown crops? I wasn't clear on what what we were trying to express there. This was language I got from Janet, so maybe she has uh, some ideas about that. I would say the Central Valley of California. <laughs> 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 having, having seen that in action, so um, you know, like most of, you know, like people would say probably industrial production, you know, you know, using pesticides, monocropping, and, you know, I mean, the, pretty much how we, is that, is that? There's something wrong with your um, yeah, something audio. Breaking up. A little I'm actually like, can you hear me or because you're kind of breaking up to me also. I don't know. It's very um, choppy and it's like there's an echo. Maybe should I leave the meeting and come back? Do you think? Actually, you're sounding that sounded OK. <laughs> oh, OK, so I was just I was just saying that, you know, basically America's industrial farming practices are unsustainable. They use a tremendous amount of oil and fertilizer and, you know, pesticides and, you know. OK, we're, okay. I just OK. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. 
yeah, I guess I'm a little bit, um, yeah, I guess I won't, let's hear what Martha has to say. Yeah, well, you know, after I <laughs> saw Chris's <laughs> uh, draft here at nine o'clock last night when I finished my other meetings, you know, I tried to, you know, rewrite some words just for alternatives. And so in, in some cases, I just tried to rewrite the same thoughts in different words. So I don't know whether you want to look at what I said at all. I think we're going to get to that afterwards. Yeah. It's part of this okay. um, document. So I wanted to go through what I had written, and then we can go through what you had written. Yeah. And then, okay, but I mean, you know, I'll make an effort to put them together at some future yeah. date. Okay, but I mean, without having to wordsmith every word uh, as we go through, that was all. I think it would be confusing to yeah. jump okay. back and forth between okay, two different- Okay, that's fine, whatever. <laughs> so is everybody okay with that sentence? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm fully comfortable with it, just um, uh, on a couple of things. One is I, I it says this is an important aspect of reducing carbon emissions that kind of needs in my mind needs a little bit of um scaling of like um it, you know how does that how is that amount relative to um other other things um you know my understanding generally of of um is as hard as it sounds trucking um produce from California here actually, you know, has carbon emissions, no doubt about it, but they're not, um, they're um, uh, not as, as, as great as people uh, think they might be. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't, I just don't want to, um, I, it'd be better to be a little bit more precise there in my mind, uh, in terms of the, this, the, this important aspect of carbon emissions, um, in terms of, how important is that relative to everything else we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dan? Yeah, I'd like to agree with you on that, Dwayne, that these are some pretty bold claims um, that might not be shared by, you know, uh, all, by all researchers for sure. Um, maybe not by all uh, residents of Amherst. So um, I think it would be a good idea to sharpen the focus on what our stated goals are without bringing in references to sustainability in this, in this specific case. Well, I think the reason that the reference is here is because the um, the claim is that we don't want to use all of our farmland for solar. We need to use our farmland for other things. So I think that's why Janet wrote this um, sentence. For yeah, but it's. I think it's. I think it's bold to assume that uh, any kind of agriculture in Amherst is going to be more sustainable than uh, agriculture from outside of Amherst. Um, I don't see any regulations that that require Amherst farmers to use more sustainable practices. So. Again, I think it's just a bold assumption. I think that there's, <clears throat> there, there's, we could turn around a little bit more positive to say um, yeah. we want to um, uh, increase our our um, availability of of local food food resources, <clears throat> and not 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 so much um, talk about external things. Um, yes, yeah, I much prefer that, Blaine. Um, we can make that make that change. Okay. Alrighty. Janet. So this language comes from the Amherst Climate Action and Resilience Plan, which the town has adopted, and it was written by ECAC. Um, so I don't think it's like an un unthought of idea. It also comes from the state at climate action plans too. And the state's plan is to increase the amount of farmland um, even marginal foreign lands, and also to increase the amount of forest cover because of the environmental services they provide. And so I don't know, it, you know, this this to me just seems obvious that having gone to the Central Valley of California, you know, watching, looking at hundreds of acres of almond trees with no weeds underneath them whatsoever um, in a desert, that the, that is not a sustainable farming practice. And then it gets shipped over here versus someone growing local nuts. I don't know. But 
I, I don't think this is this is this language has already been kind of approved by our town and by the ECAC. So I, I think, you know, we could argue like, okay, the corn so and so is growing is not as sustainable as you know X, Y, and Z. But I think these are sort of general statements to support some sort of regulation. Um, I would also add to this is the idea of economic development. Because um, you know, public welfare is also the economy. And so, you know, providing you know, it's it, public health is like having local fresh foods that's more nutritious. A lot of these local produce get go to the mobile market, which hits social justice communities. We have people coming into farmers markets. We have, you know, the local colleges and universities buying local produce that keeps the money in, in our local economy. So I think there's a lot of really positive things from this. What we have is a growing agricultural base, which is sort of astonishing. And most of it is organic, but not all of it. And, you know, and I know not everybody has your regenerative farm practices, but there's a lot of that going on too, that keeps more carbon in the soil. All right, um, Martha. Uh, yeah, and so in the version that I submitted, my, I had emphasized more the importance of locally grown food for our health, safety, and welfare, emphasizing that much of our local farmland is devoted to raising vegetables and other food crops, that we have a thriving farmer's market and the sus subscription services, and that farmers often donate their excess produce to the survival center for serving low-income peoples. And so I had stressed more the value of the local food sources and the fact that we, that much of the farmland is devoted to vegetables and other food crops here. Uh, and then Janet's statement now about supporting our local economy and so on could go into that too. Uh, but I thought that that might be the, the, the point to emphasize and then can say that, uh, you know, you go on to say that locally food reduces our reliance on distant supply sources and, and so on and reduces, uh, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, but the emphasis more on uh, the importance of local food for our health, safety, and welfare, and and then the support for the local economy. Can we wait till we get to your section of this, yeah, Martha? But I mean, before I... we argued too much over mm -hmm. the exact wording of the sentence we're we're on here right now, I, mm -hmm. you know. I, so you okay. feel that you have better wording for this? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that we'll that get to it. Section. Maybe the wording I and also seem to be egotistic or anything. I just thought mm -hmm. that. Uh, I think it it um it's both the wording and and maybe more the focus on the importance of local food production yeah. as opposed to the focus on um cutting ties with distant <laughs> food yeah. production. Um, okay, uh, Dan. Uh, yeah, sorry, you basically just said that I had my hand up for it. I would really like the idea of staying positive, focusing on how important local food production is, without not taking a dig at Hadley. Right. They're not in the town of Amherst. They're still local, but you yeah. know, so <laughs> that's it's kind of you could read it as where we're saying Hadley doesn't doesn't have sustainable farming practices. So <laughs> yeah, it's just you know and it's a long truck ride. <laughs> yeah, let's let's focus on how important local crop production is. All right. Yeah, good. And also that you know, uh we're uh, um I mean, there are many vendors, obviously, at the Amherst farm market that are from outside of Amherst, and we welcome them, and they're important to our local food supply. But um, it's not—it's not just about Amherst farms. All right. Um, okay, great. so Thanks. moving along, yeah. mm -hmm. um, the next paragraph: the town of Amherst recognizes the need to dramatically reduce carbon emissions, and one method to achieve such reduction is through sequestering atmospheric carbon in the soil through healthy soil practices. Mm -hmm. That's something everyone can agree with. Yeah, I mean, I, in my mind, yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely live with it. Um, um, it's sort of an embellishment. Yeah, I think it's important to point out. Um, I just it, it similarly to some of the other statements, it it doesn't um, sort of uh, put it in perspective of of um, uh, of our emission 
mitigation um, needs uh, of what portion this, uh, and I don't think we want to go into that detail, but um, um, it doesn't give a sense of, of how how large of an impact this is relative to other things that we're we're talking about. But not a reason to take it out. Um, or is it a reason to take well, it? Well, not not in my mind yet, at least. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, Martha. Yeah, it seems that actually it's a more general statement that could refer to forested land and other land too. Uh, you know, it may be relevant like when we come to uh, the part of the bylaw where we might be discussing uh, the actual practices during discussion, uh, during construction at a site and removal of topsoil, et cetera, et cetera. And so that this may be a, a, a good uh, statement to have somewhere in the, in the nexus place, but it may go with the more general introduction of all natural and working lands, not just farmland would be my thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's the the one of the points I was gonna uh, that it was raised is like okay, so what um, what are in the in re replacing you know be it in a forest in an open land in an agricultural land putting solar on that um, what is the impact of that on carbon uh, on soil carbon um, and I and um, that's um, not clear. It, it this sentence would seem to suggest that um, solar does not allow or disturbs the solar carbon sequestration. It may, but um, it's not clear. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Janet. So I just I want to keep reiterating that none of this is you know new. Is this is what the state is saying is trying to encourage um, healthy soils practices. It also is trying to encourage um, for sequestration to improve it as well as wood production forestry practices that increase the cutting of the forest, but also in a way that increases sequestration. And so, I don't know, these all seem to me to be kind of like, yeah, that's that's what everybody's saying. I don't know, you know, it's and it's not like we're pitting one goal against the other, is that healthy soils practices do sequester more carbon. So, you know, you know, and then the USDA is starting to pay farmers for that. And so I don't know that any of these things are really controversial, but just, you know, you know, a hay field is probably sequestering more carbon than a vegetable field that's open continuously, but maybe not if they're, you know, moving animals across it and keeping the soil very healthy. But this is what the state is saying and and the USDA and, you know, the, our action plan says, so. Okay, move along. Mm -hmm. um, next paragraph, there is enormous value in local food production and residents of Amherst don't want to sacrifice local food security for energy security. Yeah, a any comments on that, Janet? I'm not sure that we could say that because we really didn't ask them that. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, I, you know, I, I kind of support the idea that we don't, I think we can do both, you know what I mean? And I wonder, um, you could say residents of Amherst, um, recognize the importance of, you know, local food production for food security. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not sure. I like the beginning of the sentence, there's enormous value in local food production and they, you know, and that's supported by Amherst residents or something like that. I don't know if we have to say, I don't think we voted on that. Do, do people feel the same way? That that was my reaction was, I, I, I didn't feel like we had the um, <clears throat> data to, to um, make that statement. So what Janet said is there's enormous value in local food production and residents of Amherst recognize and the, the value of local production for local food security. Is that right? Did you, is that that what you sounds said? pretty, it sounds pretty good. I'm sure it'll be wordsmithing later. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then we have a paragraph about agrivoltaics. Mm. Um, agrivoltaics have the theoretical potential to generate renewable energy and provide additional income for farmers. 
without taking agricultural land out of production. Um, then this sentence, I don't know if we need this, more research is needed as well as technical support regarding crops and livestock that integrate with dual use to determine best practices for agricultural yeah. in Massachusetts. We could probably leave that second sentence out, but I think the first sentence is important. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, the town of Amherst does not encourage or support large scale solar photovoltaic installations or agrivoltaic installations that result in the long term loss of prime agricultural land. Is that something that we can all get behind? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the um the state yeah the state does neither i mean the, you, you can't get the incentive at least for the agrivoltaic installations if you're taking your farmland out of farming mm -hmm. okay um to the extent possible the town supports the use of inferior agricultural lands for large-scale solar photovoltaic installations and dual use agriculture ag agrivoltaics with grazing animals keeping prime soils to produce crops. Is that something that we agree with? Um, there was something that I think Janet sent out something from CESA that made this point that they sh that we shouldn't use prime agricultural soils for large scale solar yeah. photovoltaics. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I understood. Is that okay? Um, I might want to circle back on that um, after I check the state regulations okay. uh, on that. All righty. Then um, the next sentence. The town of Amherst acknowledges that dual use agrivoltaics is preferable to solar arrays that permanently displace farmland. In other words, I guess people would prefer, so I'm reading everybody's mind, but yeah. the sense I get from talking to people is that they'd prefer not to use farmland for solar, but if you have to use it, then dual use is preferable to mm -hmm. taking farmland out of production and only using it for solar. Is yeah. that correct? I would generally say that's correct. I mean, in my mind, um, you know, I've I've heard of, and I know there's some situations in Hadley where there is farmland, uh, but some of it is quite marginal uh, or prone to um, uh, 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 some degree of flooding that really takes it out of um, ability of practical farming, uh, and so then um, the farmers. Um, would would potentially want to put solar on those marginal marginal areas or areas that are still within farmland but not really practical for farming. Um, so um, you know, and, and again, I, we're not writing the bylaw here. These are just general statements we want to make. Uh, but maybe um, something about um, uh, is a permanently dis displaced productive farmland. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Sorry, uh, Martha. Yeah, I guess I was just a little uneasy about this, and it goes back to the above statement that based on the season that uh, agrivoltaics may be preferable than arrays that permanently displace farmland, but if you've taken something that was you know growing vegetables and crops and you change it into sheep grazing in order to fit onto your solar arrays you're certainly reducing the the value of what you're doing with the with the agricultural land and so i i'm just a little uncomfortable with that statement of whether there should be any qualification uh, to it I, I will say the state recognized that and changed their rules for agrivoltaics uh, to not allow that to happen. Uh, they uh, had to continue uh. similar farming to what you were doing before. Uh, okay. That being said, you know I, this this it doesn't um, state regulations are subject to change, and if we're trying to make this evergreen, <clears throat> um, 
then we might want to have some statement on our own, but that that is a recognized uh, uh, situation that the state has addressed, at least in their current plans and their guidelines. So maybe yeah. this paragraph needs to be yeah. looked at carefully. Yeah. Is there a way that we could look at the, what the wording is in the, in these the most recent state guidelines and see if we could come up with a wording that was sort of generally consistent with it? Just, yeah, 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 yeah. Those guidelines are, I don't have them available with me right now, but yeah, those guidelines are, uh, we look at, okay. are, are uh, posted. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. A question? Yeah, Janet. I've sort of lost the thread a little bit in terms of the concern here, because it seems like these um, three paragraphs are just like, we could pretty much, I mean, the state plan, but definitely it comes right out of our survey. It's just saying to the extent prof, prof, possible, this is preferable, the town, is, you know, it's like, that's pretty much what our, our survey said. So, but what's the concern? I'm kind of lost in what people are concerned about in this language. <clears throat> Agrivoltaics can be something that's very, very broad. And you know what, what it says earlier is that there's a lot of research going on. And certainly five years from now, there'll be much, much better designs of what works with solar and how do you space it and et cetera, et cetera, than there is right now. But right now, the fear is that if you say agrivoltaic, somebody might say, okay, we'll we'll stop raising crops, we'll just use it for sheep grazing or something to fit with agrivoltaics. I heard a lot of yeah. just sheep from the farmers, like yes, not yes, just the sheep. Poor, the poor sheep are getting maligned a lot. Here. <laughs> uh, We're all being eating a lot more sheep in the future in Amherst. <laughs> I mean, to that extent, um, we might put in the definition section um, what we mean by agrivoltaics, if we if we define agrivoltaics to be um, in line with the state rules and regulate definition of agrivoltaics, and I think we avoid some of this. Um, um, uh, you know, I, I would agree that agri knowing a lot about what's going on around the country and the world on agrivoltaics, it comes in very different shapes and size and, and forms. Um, uh, and um, uh, much of which is not um, eligible in Massachusetts, at least for the for the incentive. Uh, but if we def if we sort of tie it to the state definition, um, then that might be helpful here. Um, I I feel like we definitely need a lot more information about what it means and like what percentages are recommended and things like that in terms of what land is kept open and yeah. So I I I would bookmark this whole area for a good session or so. Okay, if anyone can send me a good definition of agrivoltaics, I would appreciate that. I did put a definition into the section on applicability and definitions, but it was just a quick grab from the internet. So. I mean, I would suggest maybe again. It's, it may not be evergreen because who knows how state rules will change. But um, you know, to to define it to reference what are called yeah, agrivoltaic um, agricultural solar tariff generation units (ASTGUs) in the Smart Program. There's a definition there and a whole independent set of guidelines on eligibility requirements for agrivoltaics. In Massachusetts, which are um, by far the most robust in the country, um, and uh, you know, I think if we can all, um, you know, ha have reference that and think of that as what we mean by agrivoltaics, um, then we will avoid the need for a lot of additional rules and regulations uh, as long as the the projects meet the guidelines and the rules eligibility at the state level. Dwayne, is it possible to send us a link to that yeah. document? Yeah, that yeah. I'll send created? that to Stephanie and then um, uh, she can send that on. Yeah. Yeah. It's what you say sounds like a, a, a sensible way to approach it. Yeah. I think okay. so. Um, so then the last paragraph that I wrote is, if a solar project is proposed for actively farmed land that is prime, unique, or of statewide importance, then dual use agrivoltaics <clears throat> is preferable to using it all for solar so that primary agricultural activities can continue 
simultaneously on that farmland. So I guess this this may be changed later on if we say we don't want to use prime agricultural land for solar at all. So that would be one way of doing it. Or if you're going to use prime agricultural land or these other categories for, for solar, then you have to, or this says it's preferable um, to have dual use. So that's kind of a conversation that we need to have, which we haven't had yet. But um, anyway, what do you think about this statement? So we need to hold off maybe until we've uh, had the other conversation and read the state definitions maybe? Come back to this, okay. All right, now, do you wanna go through Martha's? Um, what Martha wrote, I haven't yeah. actually yeah. had time to read it because I was in a meeting until 9.30 last night. Yes. Yeah, so. okay. Yeah, you beat me, Chris, Chris huh? <laughs> <laughs> by half an hour. Mm. Okay, so, um, and we'll go through Martha's and then um, in the next couple of weeks, I'll try to put these two things together. All right, so Martha, um, Amherst is home to some of the most fertile farmland in Massachusetts. <clears throat> The map of Massachusetts natural and working lands shows that cropland grassland occupies only 7% of the Commonwealth's land, primarily concentrated in our neighborhood of the Connecticut River Valley. And then she gives a reference. So that seems like a reasonable, important statement. I agree with the last one. I thought the uh, GZA, or maybe it was um, ZOMAC, um, when when he went over the maps, I thought it, it turned out that Amherst didn't have as much of the of the um, best and best in class soils. Yes. Uh, some in North Amherst, I think it was. Um, um, so I, I guess I would just um, yeah. not, not so much question the last maybe the question of the first statement, or at least uh, ask a clarification on that. Yeah, um, well, I didn't, you know, as I say, I didn't have time after my nine o'clock meeting, but I was thinking that perhaps one could add a geology statement there, because I think it's the North, North Amherst land that has more of the prime agricultural land, where the, the South Amherst doesn't as much, and it's based on where Lake Hitchcock was and all that. Do you, do you think that it would be possible to add some kind of a, a statement or 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 if we have the the map of where the prime uh, farmland soils are we could we could have a statement in there about the part of amherst in particular that had the prime soils i mean maybe just leaving it to the second sentence and then when we get to the the bylaw themselves um have language to the extent that we we want in terms of um, restricting or or um, guiding the use of, of those lands for solar, yeah. um, could could I jump in? So so most of the okay. Amherst, most if you look at the map of Amherst in terms of the soil map, most of it is prime soils. I think what Dave was saying the best soil, right? In terms of is is kind of on the other side of one sixteen towards Hadley in North Amherst. But you know, on Mitchell Farm, which is on the other side of 116, they have like you know prime soils and then um, soils of statewide importance, and then the rest of Amherst is pretty much prime soils from the soil map. Um, there's going to be issues in terms of you know clay or you know he was saying how Brookfield Farm, you know, which does produce a tremendous amount of food, didn't have the greatest soils, and I know from talking to one of the founders of Brookfield Farm, the soils were really depleted. And so they, they did a lot of effort to enrich the soils and they do regenerative farming, which they rotate animals across, you know, the different fields and things like that. So basically when you look at the soils map for Amherst, it's prime soils. And, you know, um, you know, I, I think we have lots of really good examples in South Amherst of very productive lands and wetlands too, boggy lands. So, so I would suggest that maybe we somehow add uh, a sentence or replace that first sentence with a sentence that references the soil maps. Again, then you have data. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that I guess that's the point is to try to um, yeah. make it a little bit more science based or data based. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, second paragraph. Um, access to locally grown food is important for the health, safety, and welfare of our residents. Much of our local farmland is devoted to raising vegetables and other food crops. Amherst boasts a thriving farmer's market as well as subscription services for weekly produce. Farmers frequently donate excess produce to Amherst Survival Center, <clears throat> serving low-income families with healthy food. Mm -hmm. And that's mainly comes from our CARP report. I didn't have time, as I say, since last night to find literally the page to reference from there, but the CARP report does talk uh, in the, sort of in those terms and praises the values of local food and, mm -hmm. and so on. So that perhaps we could reference it there. What's CARP? Is that? That's the, what is it? Climate action. <laughs> Are the Amherst one? No. <laughs> Climate oh, yeah. action. It's the report, whatever. whatever. Climate it's action and resiliency. Uh, yeah, okay. Report something. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's, that's the Amherst one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. it, it has a it has a lovely section about this, but I, that I've re read this week. But okay, okay. I would just um, just a, a tweak, just uh, maybe uh, change the the reference to the Amherst Survival Center to be the Amherst Survival Center, not oh yeah, not the possessive of the town. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, yes, that's yes. right. It's not it, obviously it's not a. Uh, a town thing. Okay, more comments about this paragraph? I right, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Martha, I really like this paragraph. Um, the only thing is just grammatical. Um, and we're supposed to thriving farmer's market. Then there's a period, maybe take that period out. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, might help. Your Janet and Martha have something to say. Oh, sorry. About yep. Mm -hmm. Janet, you're muted. That was a legacy hand. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So moving on. Um, moreover, locally grown food reduces reliance on distant supply chains and significantly reduces greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. And that was just my rewording of, of what Chris had already said. So it's only a choice of whose, whose words you like. <laughs> no issues with that? Um... Yeah, I guess, I mean, technically it significantly reduces greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. I'm not sure whether that transportation is significant okay. <laughs> compared, compared yeah, to yeah, right. uh, all our other emissions. Yeah, well, you know, transportation is what, 40% of our uh, emissions in Massachusetts, something like that, so. You could leave out the word significantly and just yes, say yeah. have reduces. Yeah, okay. Okay, a number of, is that it? Yeah, a number of local farmers rent the land they are using, and it, it is important to protect their livelihood from de deployment of large scale solar installations. I put, so, in other words, yeah, 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 I put that in because there is a concern on the part of some of the farmers, and I think Janet could, could talk more about this that, gosh, what happens if the landowner, wherever they are, suddenly decides to, in, you know, use the land for solar instead of renting it to the farmers. And that was, so I thought that I was just putting that in to kind of flag that particular issue. I'm not sure what we could do about that, but yeah, yeah. But it's I true. Mean, uh, it's one more reason to, to be concerned about the size of the solar arrays and on prime farm land, I think. It's an economic issue in a sense. Okay. Uh, consequently, it is critical to preserve our productive farmland and keep it in active production of food crops. Mm 
Okay. All right, no comments on that one. And then the last paragraph is, well, dual use agrivol agrivoltaics may be applicable in some cases, substitution of other agricultural uses instead of growing food crops in order to accommodate dual use solar installations should be discouraged. And again, that just goes back to the previous discussion we had and probably should you know, wait until we see what we decide on how to uh, handle the wording for agrivoltaics. Okay. I don't know what you think about that. All right, so I'll make some attempt at um, putting these two um, sections together for next time. I'm not sure I'll be here next time, but anyway. Um, all right, so- and Let me just, uh, uh, was there a hand up? No, okay, sorry, go ahead. So let's see, what was the next one that I wanted to look at? I think I said applicability and definitions, is that right? Stephanie, we haven't looked at this for a long time. Yes, and I'm since, now. And since let me um, let me just update. Let's go for like ten more minutes, and then I want to have time for public input. Okay. So applicability and definitions. Um, so Janet sent me um, many comments on this a while ago. And we haven't had a chance to review what she sent. So I thought this would be a good opportunity. Okay, applicability. That's about what is what is being talked about in this section of the bylaw. So this section applies to large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations proposed to be constructed after the effective date of this section. In other words, things that happened previously, it doesn't apply to. This section also pertains to physical modifications that materially alter the type configuration or size of these installations or related equipment. The requirements of this bylaw shall apply to large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations, regardless of whether it is the primary use of the property or an accessory use. This bylaw is not intended to regulate systems of less than 250 kilowatt, kilowatts direct current roof mounted systems or solar parking canopies. And Janet commented that she questioned whether we wanted to talk about the size of the arrays since <clears throat> um, increases in panel efficiency could lead to regulation of smaller arrays. And I answered that the currently accepted description of a large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installation is 250 kilowatts direct current, which equals approximately one acre in size. That's the that's what is being used by the state to describe this type of installation. So um, I think for now, I would prefer to use the state description rather than kind of go off and have our own description. But what do people think about that? Go ahead, Dan. Mm -hmm. oh, no. um, okay, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. yeah so, so Janet, so are, are you saying that um, basically you're more concerned about the footprint of the installation and the amount of energy that it produces? Is it's that what you're getting at with that? Yeah, I was I was just thinking yeah. that, I, that I thought that I thought that was kind of the issue is more the size of it than the current the amount of energy it produced, but I might be wrong. I also realized that yeah. if we just go with the state's description, and we have a remarkable leap in efficiency for panels, we can just go to town council and say, well, we said 250 kilowatts, now we're saying 500. So that might just be fat, might be easier just to track the state thing. Okay, yeah. Another thought that I have is we could just explicitly say like, this was, was installation is larger than one acre in size. And then I, the, is that the acre refers to the, the, num, the, the panels, right? Not just the, the entire facility, because I don't even think you can get anything on an acre if you have a setback and buffers and stuff like that. Is I that think right? it just refers to the panels. Yes. Okay, so maybe we should just stick with the kilowatts and not yeah. get all. I think the acreage okay. is a bit more problematic uh, because okay. you don't want you don't want to them to 
pack things in too densely to get around that. Uh, and with dual use, you want to spread them apart. Um, uh, and, and, the, yeah. and it's much easier to measure for certain um, the kilowatts. <laughs> Uh, but agreed. Uh, but agreed. If if efficiency changes radically, which is not really that anticipated, um, then um, uh, there can be a change. Yeah. I think the reason for putting in this one acre is just to give people a visual sense of how big that is, and that's why it says which equals approximately one acre in size. Um, well, actually, I said that, didn't I? Yeah, I'm not, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's to me, it's just a helpful way of describing it, but we don't have to say that. We can just say that 250 kilowatts. Okay. All right. Then um, under definitions, I added this definition that I found online, which is very short. Agra voltaics, agrophotovoltaics, agrosolar, or dual-use solar is the simultaneous use of areas of land for both solar photovoltaic power generation and agriculture. So that's a very simple definition. If we have some more, um, you know, some more descriptive definitions, I'd be happy to include those, but that's what I've got for now. Okay. Okay, I can share with you what the, how the state defines it, um, mm -hmm. and we might want to just reference that again. Yep. Um, which would encompass all the the regulations and guidelines associated with eligibility. All right. Okay, let's see. Um, then, um, as of right citing, that was a something that came from some of the model bylaws that I was looking at, and um, Janet suggested that um, we wouldn't really have as of right siting. We would either require site plan review or special permit. So I agreed with that. And I think we can leave out as of right siting. As of right siting means it's you just get a building permit. But I think in all cases where we have large scale ground mounted solar arrays, we wanna have control either through the planning board with site plan review or through the CBA with special permit. And we haven't really talked about that. Um, my inclination would be to make most of them special permit. But anyway, that's not something we need to talk about right now. So I'm happy to uh, delete that paragraph. Well, can I just ask a little bit just to, to uh, prep some of our thinking for future conversations um, about this? Because this actually did come up at the ECAC meeting as well um, with regard to um, obviously the zoning is more about, you know, setting restrictions and so forth. But to the extent that we want to potentially with the recognition as we set up in the um, in the uh, uh, section that we just reviewed, I forget what we call that, um, uh, about um, that we're going to have to look at uh, use of some, some uh, natural working lands and so forth. We want to be able to um, not just restrict, but also try to encourage development into that, those areas that provide least harm. Um, and uh, it was just brought up sort of at the ECAC meeting, are there ways in which zoning can incentivize that through um, as of right citing, I'm not, uh, zoning, I'm not sure if that's the right, or citing, I'm not sure if that's the right way, or the special permits that make it um, sufficiently easier uh, for the projects to be steered where we deem they would be le least harmful, if you will. Um, um, uh, I'm just wondering if, if, if there is, if, if that's what you're getting at here, Chris, uh, not necessarily for full discussion now, but is that sort of the purview of these special permits? So right now, um, the things that are as of right tend to be things like farming and building single family houses, things that are expected anywhere. Um, so you just need a building permit for it or you, in the case of farming, you don't need any kind of a permit. Um, most things that are built require either site plan review from the planning board or a special permit from the zoning board of appeals. Site plan review at the planning board is the planning board says, or the town says, we think that this thing belongs in this location, but we just want to shape it. We want to talk about setbacks or fencing or screening or lighting or access or whatever. 
um, but we think it's good in this location. And it's more, more like a review of what is proposed. And then there's an approval. A special permit um, can be denied, although in the case of solar, um, I think there would be a lot of pushback and possibly appeals. But a special permit is more um, discretionary and the Zoning Board of Appeals can you know, really cut back on a project, um, can you know, make more requirements. It's, it's difficult with solar though, because solar is uh, sort of under the umbrella of um, Chapter 48, Section 3, which some people call the Dover Amendment. Mm -hmm. And that um, restricts how much a town can control certain things. And most of them are nonprofit, religious organizations, educational institutions. Um, I think farming is one of them and solar is one of them. So you can't be too restrictive on solar, which we learned from Jonathan Murray in the fall. But you can still require a special permit. And all most of our solar installations now are being reviewed as special permits and nobody has challenged that. Um, I tend to think that a special permit is a good mechanism for reviewing um, solar, but that's a discussion that we can have. So does that explain what it's all about? I think so. Um, it's helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I just put out there, you know, are there any mechanisms, not for discussion right now, but just as we're going through the some of the language, is there opportunities to use the zoning language to um, specifically be able to encourage development where we want, not not parcel by parcel, but the types of of uh, of um, particularly in the natural working lands, uh, as we set up in the big in the introduction, that there we want to um, recognize that we're going to have to site there, but we want to site where it does least harm. Um, so how do we zone, write zoning bylaws to uh, encourage developers to find that, that those those areas uh, and, and uh, encourage them or, or incentivize them in some way through an easier, one way, you know, maybe it's through an easier process, um, uh, through, through the permitting and so forth. And I'm not sure if that's, has a place somewhere in zoning uh, but um, just something that um, I wouldn't mind keeping our eyes eyes open for. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Janet. So um, I agree with what you're saying, Dwayne, and I've been thinking about like kind of the question of like, where do you want it, right? Not just like where you don't want it. And um, one idea I had was um, the basalt mine on, on, the, on the John Lane um, company, which is solely taking apart whatever that Holyoke Mountain was, um, because like the Nature Conservancy has been buying up a lot of um, rooftop coal places in West Virginia, and they're putting in solar there. And so I was just thinking at some point, I don't know if that is an inexhaustible supply of basalt, some of which sits on my driveway, but that would be some place where you're like, yeah, that's a perfect place to solar. You know, I mean, we will, I guess it would have visual impacts. But, um, you know, it's it's never going to be used for anything else, I think, unless it turns into like a swimming hole or something. And so that might be a place. Um, apparently, we have bare land somewhere in, in Amherst. I'm not sure where that is. Or if we have subprime land, we might say that's a place we'd like to encourage it. Um, maybe that's where the overlay district goes, where there's less requirements or a lower standard of review. I don't know. Or do you know what I mean? So I think we should think about where we'd like to see it and you know and then if there's some lessening of something but i'm not sure what it, it could be you kick it to the planning board that says the solar is the use is acceptable we're just going to regulate it you know along these lines but you know um and we can't so that so that might be some idea i'm just trying to think of but i a lot of this we just have to look at the map and really like kind of comb through it yeah I, was gonna... way, I, I just have to mention that the guys at the transfer station would like some canopy so which is, I told them I'd, I'd mentioned to the group, so. Yeah. All right, good. Yeah, I was also th um, thinking that um, some of this might have to wait till we look at the maps and dig into that. Um, okay, uh, Dan. 
Yeah, I just like to say I second that, Janet. Um, that's a great idea, I think. Um, especially like former mines, things like that. Um, a great place to locate solar. Um, I'd love to have a discussion later about the types of lands in Amherst that, that we can start encouraging solar developments. Thanks for that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Chris, I, I'm I'm um, wondering if we might um, stop this process um, and move move to public comments because I, I really want to make sure that we have time. We have uh, I think five attendees um, and and see if there's any any comments uh, before we get too late. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so yep, Stephanie's back. We're we're in in the video. So great, uh, Stephanie, could you? Um, open up the opportunity for public comments. Sure. If anyone in the public would like to make a comment or ask a question, please electronically raise your hand and I will unmute you. Steve, please unmute. You can go ahead and speak. Good afternoon and, and thank you. This is Steve Roof. Uh, I live in South Amherst on Southeast Street. I'm speaking here as my own person. Um, regarding the, the draft nexus statement, um, in my opinion, it's it sounds more like a save the forest and farms statement than an intro or preface to a solar bylaw. It seems that more than 90% of the statement is about preserving lands in their current state Preserving the natural working lands is important, but the nexus barely addresses and does not at all justify the absolutely critical need for us to be developing clean, renewable energy to replace fossil fuel use. Um, one of the things that should be referenced in that nexus is the 2019 adoption by the town council, the commitments for reducing carbon emissions. Um, that's separate, that's distinct from the CARP. So I'm, I'm asking you guys, can the Solar Bylaw Working Group agree with the principle that the proposed Amherst Solar Bylaw should allow for sufficient development of solar in town to meet Amherst's and Massachusetts climate commitment? Can you guys agree with that principle and maybe help use that to help shape the final bylaw? And, and given that less than 2% of Amherst land is likely needed for solar development, and Amherst has already permanently preserved more than 30% of its land as open space, and I believe that's not counting additional preserved agricultural land, I do not think there needs to be a conflict. What we don't want is a situation where the proposed solar bylaw is inconsistent with the commitments made by the town council in 2019, those greenhouse gas reduction targets, and putting the town council in the unfortunate position of having to choose between adopting the solar bylaw and rejecting or going back on their 2019 commitments for greenhouse gas reductions. So I would like you guys to take up and discuss whether the committee, the working group, can agree with the principle that the Amherst Solar Bylaw should allow for sufficient development of solar in town to meet Amherst's existing climate commitments. So I look forward to hearing that discussion and thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Steve. And Jenny Kallick, you can go ahead. <laughs> thank Jenny, you're on mute if you're trying to speak. Yeah, Jenny, you need to unmute yourself. How's that? Am I there? Now we can Okay, hear. thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make reference to uh, the appointment of a new cabinet role by the governor, uh, Melissa Hoffer, who's now the climate chief. She's been around. I was in a meeting with her uh, and she's looking at uh, regional planning for the uh, clean energy, but also of great interest maybe to your group is before too long, there's gonna be a new commission 
on solar siting because the governor is so aware of how difficult it is to sort out all these different priorities. And that commission will uh, be represented by all kinds of constituents, including solar uh, companies, but also communities that have different kinds of issues. And uh, Melissa Hoffer is her name. She says it will be coming online very soon and it will be possible for you all to interact with the commission and perhaps get some clarity uh, about some of these issues. And I'll just repeat what she said to make it a little more sticky. Uh, came up in the meeting about how expensive and more expensive canopy and rooftop is compared to ground mounted. And this is a member of the cabinet and the new uh, climate chief. And she said, that information is not correct and that people need to look at it more carefully. So obviously I can't verify or give you details about it, but she is very available. Her name's Melissa Hoffer. She gave us all her email. She's happy to be in touch with anybody who would like to follow up with her. Uh, and she'll be a tremendous resource for the state going on because as they say, uh, more Healy feels, our governor feels, this is very, very difficult for communities and uh, they want to help as much as possible as communities sort out what they want to do. Uh, so I hope that's helpful information. Thanks again, everybody, for a great meeting and all your work. And anyone else want to make a comment or ask a question of the working group? Please raise your hand. And there look to be no more questions or comments, but um, Duane, if I may, I just want yes. to follow up with Jenny's comment that I'm actually attending a conference next week in which Melissa Hoffer will be speaking at the opening reception. So I will certainly be listening very closely and carefully to what she has to say, and hopefully we'll bring back the same and maybe additional comments that she may have had that are re relevant to this work. Great, thank you. All right, any, um, I guess with regard to uh, next meeting, uh, let's just double check here, um, which is on the 26th at 1130. Um, I think our primary agenda uh, will again be our someone our standing agenda continue with the um, with the review of the uh, of the language uh, that um, Chris uh, brings forward to us, um, and uh, and I, I would like to you know reflect on the comments that we heard today um, and um, and the conversation we had today to sort of move this forward. I think in two veins. One is is sort of the what might we be able to do with regard to language that helps to encourage solar where we where we. Uh, uh deem it to be least harmful and most appropriate um and second um i certainly would agree agree with um steve's comment that at least in their nexus statement um to to give um drive home the point that we have a climate emergency that we need to address um and uh and that is what's motivating um this as well um so let me um, uh, uh, let me go with um, Martha and then Chris close us out. Yeah, I mean the nexus statement is as I see it right now. It's just kind of bits of thoughts that we're trying to put together. It hasn't come through as coherent and clearly. You know, I think we all recognized all along we needed a starting paragraph that that talks about the general climate situation and so on and sets the context and so on. And then we need to talk. Uh, you know, so there's quite a bit left to do, I think, in the nexus statement that way to make it a coherent uh, statement. Some of the other things, a few of those pending decisions that we have to make really can't be done until we've had a good session looking at the maps. Yeah. So we can go through lots of things, but I really caution that 
there are some significant decisions that, that just have to wait until we can see what we're doing. Okay. Yep, yep, yeah. I, I agree. The maps are gonna be really helpful to us. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Um, Chris looks like she's doing something else. So um, Janet, we'll go with you and then Chris, okay. <laughs> I was wondering if, Dwayne, if you could get us some dual use info. Like I, I was like looking at the American Farmland Trust, which you know wants to have vegetables grown on prime land and dual use, and they had like this really you know beautiful video of a farmer and he's haying and everything, and and so I just, but it didn't have any like facts if that makes any sense. Like and so, I would just love more information about the experiments that have been going on at UMass, like what works, what doesn't work. I wonder also about the size of the farm that you would need for dual use since we don't have large farms, except for maybe on Bramble Hill is probably the biggest one I can think of off the top of my head. But I just wondered, is there, a, you know, just can you get us some information on what's the experimentation is, what the results are, what the concerns are um, and things like that? Because I just, you know, I'd love to read more materials on that too. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can put, pull some stuff together. What I'd say just uh, to, to, for some quick feedback is that um, um, there, in it, with regard to agrivoltaics as they are defined and being developed in Massachusetts, um, there are uh, now probably several dozens that dozen that have been. Um, approved, um, but only a, a relative few that have been constructed. Uh, and so there are not really many at all years of of, um, out, uh, of, of outcomes yet uh, in terms of how, how they're working. Um, uh, the work that we're doing under some federal DOE uh, funding is working with um, three to six, depending on what gets constructed this coming year, um, of these commercial systems to do robust research site trials to help answer those questions. But we're a, a year and two away from from findings uh, of of scientific value. Uh, but there's a lot of anecdotal um, evidence or, or or outcomes as well that um, uh, we might we might discuss. Okay, uh, Chris. Um, I just, uh, everything is, there's a lot happening here. I'm going on vacation. <laughs> and <laughs> Good. So okay. I'm going to be missing the next two scheduled meetings. Um, okay. The meeting okay. on the 26th and the meeting on the 9th. So perhaps, you know, I can possibly write something before I leave, but um I don't know. You might want to think about doing something else for one or both of those meetings or possibly rescheduling one of them, yeah. like rescheduling the 9th to the 16th or something. I won't be here on the 26th either. Yeah. The next meeting. Who is that? Sorry. Janet. Janet. Okay. That's yeah. right before Memorial Day. So maybe other people oh, are yeah. taking off that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Um, Dwayne, I won't be here on the 9th, so you won't have any staff support i mean we okay. could find somebody to support the meeting but i won't be here on the ninth either yeah okay um, uh, yeah I, uh should, should we ask everybody to send in their vacation schedules um to, to uh to, to stephanie if that's okay yeah um, please if you do that then we can determine when we're going to have a quorum and when we won't and also staff support as well because we'll have to coordinate yeah. getting folks here if if Chris and I can't be here. Yeah. So if you could get those to me, I'll put them together. Yeah, okay, okay, and, good. And then we might want to just, you know, take a pause on trying to wordsmith and so on, on some of these uh, Chris's language, if she's not gonna be here and, and maybe think about what's the other information we need. Now, whether we could have that map session could be very important, you see because it could be a day when we agree that we're not going to be trying to wordsmith draft sections, but we're really going to discuss the maps of what can go where. And maybe we could find somebody that could make a presentation, somebody from, you know, IT staff or planning board staff or something could, could do that for us and take advantage of, of one of our sessions. Um, 
There's other possibilities that we could do of, you know, we, we've been talking around the edges quite a few times of some of the of disasters that have happened on solar projects and why, and were there things that have could, could have been prevented by, do, you know, somehow managing the construction process differently? You know, is it worthwhile to, to analyze and get the facts of any more of those in detail so that when we write the section of, you know, how the construction oversight goes and uh, or slope requirements and so on, we would have a better understanding. Uh, so those are just suggestions of things we could do to use our time uh, in the meantime. All right, I'm I'm um, we're a bit over time. Um, uh, um, so what do you think? Well, I know that I, I strongly doubt the mapping will be ready for two weeks from now. Well, then maybe we should just post uh, and, our meetings. and then the uh, I'd rather Stephanie be with us when we go through the mapping, even if it's with the GIS, the GIS person um, that may be available by the ninth, but that may be pushing it as well. Um, I'll check in again. Um, I did follow up last week to try to find out and get a better handle on when we could expect it, but. Um, I thought I would hear something by now and I haven't, so I'll reach out again. Okay. Um, all right, I guess, why don't we, um, and maybe Stephanie, could you put an email out to everybody just because there's a few of us that are not here to get, mm -hmm. get, you, yeah, get you their vacation yep. schedules for the summer. Yep. Um, and then, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to um, rescheduling like the 9th for the 16th or, or the 26th for the 16th um if that works out better yeah or sure. you know, tutorials on on the agrivolcaics or and maybe bring in some farmers maybe do the way you know how ec has been ecac has been having little tutorials maybe we could have a discussion that would involve some local farmers and you or uh, some one of your colleagues giving a discussion of um, some of the umass work on the dual use you know Agrivoltaics, that might be something that would be useful to everybody and in the end might help us to shape that part of the bylaw. So that's, again, a suggestion of what we could do uh, sort of during a pause. Yep. Okay. Um, I guess I'm, uh, what, what if, what if uh, Chris is out next time, the 26th. Um, and I guess it is that is Memorial Day weekend or the beginning of Memorial Day weekend. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, and so, do other people have plans to be away <laughs> or not? Janet May. Yeah, I'm not going to be here. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so that might be something to. to figure out if we can if we need to reschedule that one i'm i will be available but i'm also hosting some folks <laughs> um, that that i'd have to excuse myself from uh, for a while which would, could probably work but um, um so well we we have um three members that are not here yeah so why don't we find out if we would have a quorum yeah and we can at least draft, you know, an agenda, a potential agenda. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I mean, I, I could throw, I'm, I'm not, I'm not too sure how we would, um, I mean, I, I can, I'd be happy to talk a bit more about agrivoltaics and our experience and, and the research we're doing um and and my general understanding of of of, of uh, agrivoltaics the other person i'm thinking about um obviously he's from a company but he knows <clears throat> very much about agrivoltaics um particularly at on smaller farms uh he would know about the rules and regulations uh of agrivoltaics uh and that's um um uh, uh jake marley yeah. uh, um who who um does this for a business um and is is um works works around the region but is uh located in amherst uh business located in amherst um uh so he 
um, I could invite him to spend some time with us to give his insights. Obviously, he's from a private for-profit business, uh, but he's generally pretty um, level-headed and and uh, works particularly with um, local farmers and smaller smaller farmers, as opposed to some of the other, many of the other agrivoltaic companies that are very focused on on larger multi-megawatt scale projects, uh, yeah. which. Yeah, that sounds interesting to me, it certainly. Uh, if we could sp then specifically invite our, some of our local farmers to listen in. Well, I'm not sure if, we're, if our job is to be an educational outreach like yeah. e ECAC, uh, we're a little bit different yeah, well, in that we, way. We can still advertise it. I mean, if we have that set up, we can publicize that we're doing it. Everybody can listen I think in. It's, I, like, I like the idea. And I, I also, I know Fred Bettle has, you, know, you can read from his um, op-ed pieces, you know, really questioning the dual use, but he said that he had, when I talked to him, a 20 minute, maybe he could make it shorter. Um, he has a slideshow of ways he thinks dual use could, could work. And so that might be helpful for us to look at. And um, you know, I know Jake Marley very peripherally, and so it'd be interesting to talk to people who have really thought about it and he's working on with small farms. I think he'd be a great ad. But I, I do think we shouldn't be afraid to talk to farmers and have them come in and participate because, you know, when I talked to another Amherst farmer, you know, he knew exactly, he wanted, you know, he had one field that he leased that he was thinking for solar because he had already maxed out his, you know, twice, you know, twice as much, as, you know, as his use. And, but he also knew exactly where on his farm the bad soil was. He was like, if I could put more in, here's where I'd put it because it's really wet and blah, 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 blah. And so these are the people who really know what's going on, you know, and, and I think that'd be useful for us to hear. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to that. I'm, I'm just always cautious about inviting, inviting in some quote unquote random farmers or who we happen to know and 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 whether we can draw generalizations from that or or should draw generalizations from that, um, that would be that's sort of my main concern with that. Um, and 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 you know and what whether we learn things that are applicable throughout farming in mass in Amherst or or is it, um, you know how 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 much can we extrapolate from what we hear from from um, uh, how, just how else how else can we learn about this. Yeah. What's the alternative? Dan? Dan has an alternative. Okay. Yeah. What if we brought in an advocacy organization for farmers like the American Farmland Trust um, or some organization like that who, who has, you know, data and, and experience talking with people like us about farm issues? Would they be able to talk about local things they they would um the person i i might reach out to there is ethan winter who sort of leads up their agrivoltaic work on a national basis but he um um uh he he would certainly know massachusetts fairly well as well i'm not sure about amherst per se but um but what's going on in massachusetts yeah i mean we wouldn't want somebody who's you know used to the wheat fields of the midwest or the no no he would recommend california or something yeah yes. no they have like local policy directors who are very familiar with um like Dwayne was saying with issues um in in massachusetts well, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be american primary trust i'm sure there's others yeah there. i mean it then it's just Dwayne, the it came to mind. like we could put together an interesting session and take advantage of while Chris was away to, uh, you know, pause and, and, and really try to understand it, this, this issue. And uh, Well, I, I, let me, let me um, suggest we aim for the ninth um, because I, I think it might be. The ninth early, of June. Ninth of today. June. Yeah. Um, and well, if you could email us around a proposed uh, you know selection or something in advance or some way we could uh, give feedback maybe at our next meeting and and put that together with the you know well, that may 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 be season. our next meeting if we skip the 26 oh, okay. is my concern okay um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So want... Stephanie's Somehow. gonna be away on the ninth yeah but but that but that might be okay in the sense of if this was something that was not you know, 
directly wording the the bylaw or something, right? All we need is just somebody to 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 set up the um, the uh, link. Right. Right. Yeah, you just need the meeting set up, but you do, you yeah. won't have, I mean, I don't know, we can try to find staff support. You just won't have Chris or I at the meeting is all. Yeah. But we but, can certainly find somebody to, um, I, everything will be set up ahead of time. All they need to do is show up and start the meeting. Yeah. So um, that might know. be okay because then, you know, the meeting is recorded so that. Uh, well, yeah. if we don't have a quorum, we still couldn't. We right. Couldn't. If you don't have a quorum, you can't do it. So, I mean, in right. some way I need to wait until. Yeah. or you all need to wait until we have everyone's vacation schedule. <coughs> so that's why everyone should get them to me as soon as possible. And I'll be sending in a reminder as soon as this meeting's over. Yes. Great. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Right. But let's, um, uh, unless we hear otherwise, let's, what, let's plan to meet the 26th. Um, but, um, but then we'll, we'll, um, we'll, I'll work with Stephanie and, and Chris. Well, Chris will be a waste, uh, but um, to see um, what the result is of the, vacation schedules and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? All right. All Have right. a nice weekend. Thank Bye -bye. you. Yeah. Enjoy Thank the you. weekend. Yeah. Apparently it's like 80 <laughs> degrees out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.